Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Let us begin the season of fasting with rejoicing, giving ourselves to spiritual strife, purifying soul and body, fasting from passions as we fast from foods, faring on the virtues of the Spirit, which if we continue to long for, we shall all be worthy to behold the most solemn passion of Christ and the Holy Passover, rejoicing with spiritual joy. This is a verse from what we will be praying later this evening at Forgiveness Vespers. Brothers and sisters, we've come to the last day before the beginning of Great Lent. The fast begins tomorrow, or if we want to be a little more precise, it begins at sunset this evening when we celebrate Vespers, but we don't have to be that critical. Today is known as Cheese Fair Sunday because it's the last day that we eat cheese or dairy products before Pascha. Now the dietary guidelines are not the goal of the fast. We can easily fall into that trap which can very easily just completely derail our fast. The main purpose of the fast is repentance. We are learning to eat more simply and generally to live more simply in order to focus our fasting on repentance. And that's not to say that the rules related to food, that they are useless or that they should be ignored without consideration, but we should understand them in the context of humility, moderation, and simplicity. And if they're too difficult for us, we can seek some guidance as to how to apply them without adding unintended complexity to our life. A simple fast can help us to enhance our prayer life and to acquire humility and obedience and all the virtues that we need in the spiritual life. That's why we embrace the fast with joy. Now those of you who were here last night at Vespers or even earlier today during Matins would have heard verses about the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise as a result of disobedience. We commemorate this event today when we are at the doorsteps of Lent to remember what we have been contemplating for the past few weeks, that we are in exile, exile from our true home. We don't belong here. We belong to the kingdom. And our life is a journey back to that paradise which has been lost. Like Adam, we live most of our life in disobedience, in disobedience to the Word of God. And as a result, we have lost the way, we have become lost away from our home. So Great Lent becomes an icon of this journey, a time during which we live out the struggles of that journey a little more intensely. But since the journey is leading us back to paradise, we embrace the fast with joy. And what does it mean to embrace the fast with joy? Isn't repentance an experience of sorrow or sadness? And here we get to something that is perhaps most unique to the Orthodox tradition, and that is the experience of Great Lent as a bright sadness or a joyful sorrow. And that's not just a clever play on words. Anyone who's been to the services of Great Lent, especially weekday services, will know exactly what this means. The services seem longer, the chants are a little monotone, the lights are dim, the vestments are dark, 
And for a while it seems like nothing is happening. But in the middle of this we begin to notice in the words of Father Alexander Schmemann, a mysterious transformation taking place within us. We gradually stepped away from the world, the noise is beginning to fade away, and our constant state of anxiety begins to release, and we start to feel free. We begin to witness within us a unique kind of happiness, not a happiness which comes and goes about 20 times a day, but a kind of deep happiness which comes from our souls having touched another world. It is the experience we get when our souls touch a world that is made of, a, of light, of peace, of joy and a deep trust in God's love. This is the experience or foretaste of paradise to which we are looking. Now we won't get to experience any of this if our fast does not go beyond keeping rules and reading food labels and constantly worrying or worse bragging about what we eat. We will never experience joy if we don't make changes that allow our souls to touch this other world. This means we need to live or to learn how to live in simplicity. Eating more simply is part of the fast, but it's not all of it. It's probably actually the easier part, the easier part that trains us for the harder part. Hopefully as we learn to consume less and more simple foods, we will also acquire simplicity in how we consume other things, like not consuming each other with slander and gossip, like abstaining from judgment and anger and limiting how much we consume the world through our digital media. I hesitated whether to include this or not, but we really need to give serious thought to how, consume, to how we consume technology on our electronic devices. The internet is connected to every part of our life, and so it is becoming impossible to completely unplug. But we need to try to set boundaries around our use of devices. And I can't tell you what this will look like for you. You know the pattern of your use. But here are some practical suggestions from people who have spent more time considering this. How about we only use our devices for what is necessary for work. That might be a little extreme. So maybe we try to set some time restrictions. Use a timer if you have to. Maybe we can establish around our house tech-free zones where we don't use our phones. Maybe we can avoid wasteful habits like infinite scrolling out of boredom or without purpose. These are simply a few suggestions. But like the food guidelines, any limits we place on our use of technology should not become the objective in itself. Remember, the objective of Lent is repentance. So our goal is to allow our souls to touch that other world that brings about the deep transformation in our hearts. Whatever time we free up from technology, we need to spend in prayer, in reading scriptures, in edifying books, or simply being present to the people in our lives, our families, our friends, those we work with, and 
as we become more present to God and more present to others, we discover that the point of the fast is to restore us to love. So to embrace the fast with joy means to embrace it with love. That means to pray with love, to fast with love, to give alms with love, and yes, even to grieve with love, that is, with joy. It means to do all those things with love and joy, but what kind of love? Is it a skill that we develop? I'm sorry to say no. It's not a skill, it is a gift. It's a free gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we earn, nor is it something we imitate by trying harder. It is a gift that we receive when we acquire the life of Christ. It's a new life. I'll give you an example based on the virtue of forgiveness. In this morning's Gospel, the Lord is teaching His disciples about forgiveness. He says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will, the, will your Father forgive your trespasses. This comes in the Gospel right after the Lord has been teaching the disciples how to pray. He gives them the prayer of the Our Father, in which we say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Here I want to stress that we shouldn't ascribe fallen human characteristics to God. When the Lord says that if we don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will God or the Father forgive us. The Father does not withhold forgiveness by withholding His love, like we do when we refuse to forgive someone. The God, God is always willing to heal and to forgive. Even on the cross, the Lord prays for the forgiveness of those executing Him. But what we need to understand is that as we withhold forgiveness from others, we make it impossible for ourselves to receive God's forgiveness. <coughs> Now back to the point on forgiveness. Are we capable of that kind of forgiveness that the Lord displays on the cross? Are we able to forgive immediately like the Holy Father is teach? Are we able to love the person hurting us even as they inflict pain on us? Of course the answer is no not on our own power. It is not simply a matter of willpower. I'll try harder and maybe next time I'll do better. No. Rather, the Lord is ready to forgive in us. He is the author of forgiveness and we can become co-forgivers with Him if we allow Him. He has already infused us with His image. And so He is offering us this kind of life and this kind of virtue today and every day. We soil that image every day, but He's already washed us in baptism and given us His life. And He washes us again daily through the tears of repentance and He gives us His life anew. That's why during the fast we fix our eyes on the cross not as an instrument of death and torture but as an instrument of love and life, the life that comes from the resurrection. This evening the Church invites us to exchange mutual forgiveness from one another so that we can enter into Great Lent free from anger and resentment. We do this liturgically once a year, but we are always called to exchange forgiveness 
with joy. We can forgive with joy because forgiveness frees us from anger and passions. It frees us from our ego and it opens the door for us to begin to acquire humility. It restores our relationships with those who have wronged us and those whom we have wronged and with everyone around us. Now if you're planning to attend tonight's service, and I strongly recommend that, and if it's your first time, you might feel a little uncomfortable. That's okay. It's because we're not used to that kind of love. It disorients us. But to regain your orientation, I invite you to listen to the chanters while we're doing this. They will be singing the Paschal Canon. Because the resurrection is our destination from the very first step we take into the fast. Because that's how we receive Christ's life. May God give you strength for a blessed and fruitful fast. Kalustadio, Kalutinami, Samumbarak. Amen.